Good morning. What a joy to be here. It has been, um, this is my first time being here at St. George's. I supply all over the diocese, and I am honored and privileged to be with all of you this morning. And I really thank all of those that helped me feel so welcomed. It is important for all of us to start thinking, what is God saying to the church today about what we heard in Scripture? And for us to start thinking, how many more people would love to come and feel the community and be a part of St. George's? But before we get started, it's Mother's Day, and I have a joke for you. One early morning, a lady went in to wake up her son. Wake up, son. It's time to go to school. The son says, but why, Mom? I don't want to go. Mom says, well, give me two reasons, dear, why you don't want to go. The son says, well, the kids hate me, for one, and the teachers hate me, too. Mom says, oh, that's no reason to not go to school. Come on now and get ready. The son turns around and says, well, give me two reasons why I should go to school. The mom replies, well, for one, you're 52 years old. <laughs> and for another, you're the principal. Yes, <laughs> and while we can definitely appreciate this joke, we all can relate to outer circumstances not being what we hope for. The lessons today have a common message about such fear, anxiety, stress, and uncertainty. By the way, a raise of hands, does anyone know of those feelings at all? Raise your hands if anyone has ever felt uncertain or fearful. Oh, good. We're on the right track then. Okay, good. Our faith and perception makes the difference. My dear brothers and sisters, you need to all understand that our relationship with God is paramount in the abundant life. God has provided for each of us through Christ. We must think and act act within a paradigm that we are a holy people of God, and that no matter the situations we encounter, we are in the very intimate presence of God, and that nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Can I hear an amen on that? Amen. Thank you. Remember this. Christ's resurrection is our resurrection. What is God saying to the church today? What are we going to hear, say, and believe to activate our faith and live our lives to the fullest? It is during this season of Easter for us to be renewed, strengthened, empowered as the incarnation of Christ. As Richard Rohr stated this week, the resurrection is not a one-time miracle that proved Jesus was God. Jesus' death and resurrection name and reveal what is happening everywhere and all the time in God. Christ's resurrection is our resurrection. In our first lesson in the book of Acts, a deacon and our first martyr of the church, St. Stephen, is read about a resurrected and ascended believer, a dedicated servant of God, he expressed and defended his feelings as a follower of the way. Due to the growth of the number of Jewish converts by St. Stephen's and, and the candid statements of incorrect temple law to the Sanhedrin, Stephen was stoned to death. Now you're probably wondering why even read this. That doesn't sound like good news. But even in that crisis and great suffering as a martyr, 
He desires to forgive his enemies and ultimately sees before him Christ standing with him. Published author and lecturer Father Bill Countryman just led our clergy conference this last week and stated, We as Christians are living in troubled times. Challenging times like these has shown that we need to be equipped as an Easter people, loving and appreciative of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and not, as Stephen put it, end up as stiff-necked people who, just as their ancestors had done, resisted the Holy Spirit. We must pray for our enemies, too. Stephen prayed that the Lord would receive his spirit and his killers be forgiven. It is through the paradigm of knowing our limited love versus God's unboundless love for all of us produces loving behavior. Faith and trust is relational. According to Father Bill, hating one another is the same as stoning or murdering one another. Hatred makes each other deaf to our opponents. As you reread the book this week and the, uh, the verses in the book of Acts, we must love those that we even disagree with. In the book of Acts, St. Stephen's life and death became a strong witness of the resurrected people, including in front of the feet of Saul of Tarsus, who approved of his killing, and who also later became, from Saul to, good, Paul the Apostle. And that's an incredible miracle. It is probable that the parallels of the life of our Lord and St. Stephen, they both perform miracles. They're both tried by the Sanhedrin. They both prayed for forgiveness for their killers, began to plant seeds in the hearts of the enemies, and opened up the gates of God's amazing grace for the church in thought, word, and deed. Even in the most challenging times of the early church, Transformation and healing spread like wildfire in the least expected individuals to be called the holy, resurrected, and ascended people of God. You see, I have been a clinical chaplain for over four years. I've worked in a 400-bed hospital. I worked with death and dying on a daily basis, especially emphasizing in palliative care and transition into hospice. And I must tell you right now, there is a holy, holy, sacred thing that really happens when people come together in that time and where people are really being transformed and being healed in different ways before or afterwards of that transition. Many of the patients, though, come to me and tell me that they hadn't been to church for years. They hadn't read the Bible for over 40 years, some of them said. Some of them have never even stepped in a church. And that they were missing something. They didn't know what it was. God is planting seeds in each and every one of us to be called to let the people know the good news of Jesus Christ. And we, as Episcopalians, have that opportunity each and every day. In his book, Forgiven and Forgiving, Father Bill states that forgiveness is taking the risk of conversion, experiencing a change of mind in which we embrace the joy of God's creative love in place of our own hurt and anger and sense of helplessness. God's love makes us strong and rich and able to give and forgive. Christ's resurrection is our resurrection. In the second lesson of 1 Peter, our relationship with God continues to be a priority. Questions that arise in such a text should be ruminated and answered with sincerity in each of our spiritual journeys. How have we lately tasted that the Lord is good? How have we, as a resurrected people of God, become like living stones for Christ, for others? How have we expressed in thought, word, and deed that we all are a part of the holy priesthood, 
a chosen child of God that has been called out of the darkness into marvelous light. How are we offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God? What are our daily intentions to become all that God has created us to be? You have outside in your uh, courtyard area a board that says the life board. Am I right? Well, I read some of those chalk remarks and statements, and that's all good. But that whole board needs to be in your own homes every day, too, for all of us. What are we going to do before we die? God uses us in our life and in heaven. We are all in that eternal life. But how is God using us now? What are we going to do now? In the book of joy, His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Desmond Tutu share a spiritual morning exercise that is a way of preparing our minds and hearts on how we wish to face the day and setting our intentions, our goals as holy people of God. The Archbishop celebrates the Eucharist each morning reading and pondering biblical passages, and observes liturgies of the sacred hours in prayer, as well as reads passages from the great mystics. Penny and I have been working on this for the last two to three years. That's my wife. We together go ahead and have morning prayer every morning. If you haven't experienced that, I encourage you to take the time to do that. The prayer book is rich. I've talked to an Episcopalian that's been one for over 20 years that came up to me last week, last Sunday at another parish, and said, what is morning prayer? What is Compline? I've never heard of these words. I was, I was dumbfounded, but I was also excited, excited to be able to open the prayer book and for them to see. Penny and I, just last week, we were rushing, hurrying, trying to get to work. We just, I told Penny as we're running down, Penny, we just don't have time to pray. My wife turns around and says, excuse me, we don't have time to pray, priest? (laughs) Oh, 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 yes. Yes, you're right, you're right. I I may have culpa. We went ahead and we prayed, and we realized that that prayer each morning of us getting together changes our whole day and our whole perspective. The morning exercise could also include stating our intentions, as it says in the book, the Book of Joy. Today, may I greet everyone with the love of Christ, or today, may I be less judgmental, or today, may I see the face of Christ in all people. Such spiritual practices guide us to being more compassionate, to be living stones to a hurting world that needs ambassadors of Christ, and to be a holy expression of the good news of our Lord. We need to live and love life like we have been raised from the dead ourselves. Which, by the way, as Christians, aren't we? That is our baptismal covenant. Christ's resurrection is our resurrection. In our gospel lesson this morning, I encourage you all this week to read John chapters 13 to 17, the final discourse in the fourth gospel. I urge you to look at those five chapters that can transform a Christian and open up our hearts and minds to know that we are in intimate relationship with God through the life-giving spirit, and what that translates to mean through Christ Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. With Christ and in Christ. Can you imagine the night that Jesus provided profoundly comforting teachings around the meal table, of them all being one with Christ, belonging and interconnected, The disciples and all of us need to be ready to live as resurrected people, as an Easter people, 
as an ascended people of God because the body of Christ will go through a lot of tribulation in the days ahead. And we all must be equipped, strengthened, and edified, knowing that Christ will never leave us. We as the church must be empowered by the Holy Spirit to even do greater things than Jesus did. Isn't that what we read? And we can with God's help. Indeed, how many of us have heard these opening verses of chapter 14 at at funerals or memorial services in the church. We do not have to wait until we die to be that witness. But can the reign of God be established in our realm now? What kind of life on earth would we have as a resurrected people of God if the dwelling place means being converted in the understanding to live in the present and in the intimate presence of God? Resurrected and ascended life means with and within God. It means being in that marvelous light every moment with the living Christ in us, sharing in that intimate bond that is forever constant, no matter our outward circumstances or location. We are all encouraged to plant the seeds in in the hearts of others, including ourselves. The Archbishop Desmond Tutu from the Book of Joy shares the embracing of the joy of God's love and requires to offer up our suffering and unite it with all that Christ Jesus has done. Every day, think as you wake up, I am fortunate to be alive. I am a precious human life. I am not going to waste it. Expressing gratitude for the gift of life for God's incarnation through us by the power of the Holy Spirit for seeing the Christ in others and the ability as a resurrected person to see wonder, surprise, possibility in each experience and in each encounter that is a core aspect of joy. Recognizing the importance of gratefulness allows us to shift our perspective toward all we have been given and all that we have. It moves us away from the narrow-minded focus, stiff-necked, on fault and lack, and to the wider perspective of benefit and abundance. I close with the words of an American spiritual philosopher and well-known author on Christian spiritual formation. The gospel is less about how to get into the kingdom of heaven after you die and more about how to live in the kingdom of heaven before you die. Christ's resurrection is our resurrection. Amen.